Good morning. I'm Kenneth Moten. And I'm Janae Norman. Here are the top five things to know this Wednesday. Number one, Republicans have held on to a congressional seat in North Carolina. But political analysts say Dan Bishop's narrow victory in Tuesday's special election could spell trouble for President Trump in 2020. Bishop, a staunch conservative, defeated moderate Democrat Dan McCready by only two points in a district that President Trump won by 11 points in 2016. The president campaigned for Bishop, and overnight he took credit for that win. Number two, significant damage is reported in Sioux Falls. South Dakota after a possible tornado. The mayor reports widespread power outages. Many streets are impassable. One woman said the storm sounded like a freight train over her house. Meanwhile, a large tornado moved through eastern Wyoming, destroying an RV. Baseball-sized hail shattered windows in the area. It was one of 11 twisters in that region in recent hours. On to number three, NFL star Antonio Brown is facing a civil lawsuit accused of sexually assaulting his former trainer. Brown, who recently joined the New England Patriots, denies the allegations. ESPN reports NFL Commissioner Roger Goodell could place Brown on a so-called exempt list, meaning he would not be able to join the Patriots' active player list while the league investigates the allegations. We head to Nevada for number four. The creator of the Storm Area 51 Festival is now bailing out. Maddie Roberts says he's worried about a lack of funding and organization. The event started as a joke online and turned into the Alien Stock Music Festival. The original idea was to storm the site where the government is supposedly conducting experiments with space aliens. Despite the uncertainty, another organizer promises the show will go on. I do not understand what happened, but it is what it is, and it will be what it will be, and I'm going to trudge forward, and I'm going to, you know, I, I, I basically promised everybody an event, and so the event is still going to happen. As Connie West there, she owns the motel near where the event is scheduled this month. She says she has at least 20 bands and two comedians scheduled to perform. And finally from us this Wednesday, number five, a bizarre crash caught on camera. Watch this delivery truck that managed to get wedged between a house and a power pole north of Toronto. The driver was not heard, but he is facing a careless driving charge. Power had to be cut off to get the truck free. Incredible. Good Wednesday morning. Thank you for joining us. Hard to believe today marks 18 years mm -hmm. since the terrorist attacks on September 11th, 2001. Very solemn anniversary. So many um, events commemorating um, that terrorist event so many years ago. And again, generations, or at least a generation, yeah. doesn't even wasn't even born yet. And it's hard to believe, as you said. So we'll be talking about that a little bit later. But we'll start uh, getting to that big story, the growing fallout at the White House after, excuse me, the departure of National Security Advisor John Bolton. Bolton says he quit, but President Trump says Bolton was fired. Now the question What's next? ABC Serena Marshall has the latest. Serena, good morning. Janae, good morning. This latest major shakeup at the White House comes amid major disagreements between these two men, but this one so severe they can't even agree how it happened. After 17 months, President Trump's third national security advisor, John Bolton, being told, you're fired. The news coming in a Tuesday tweet. I informed John Bolton last night that his services are no longer needed. I disagreed strongly with many of his suggestions. Therefore, I asked John for his resignation, which was given to me this morning. Twelve minutes later, Bolton tweeting, it wasn't a firing, but a resignation. I offered to resign last night and President Trump said, let's talk about it tomorrow. And texting Fox News in real time. He's watching. Can you read it? He, yeah, he said, uh, let's be clear, I resigned. The closing contradiction caps off months of contention between the two. John Bolton is absolutely a hawk. It's up to him. He'd take on the whole world at one time, okay? Do you take Kim Jong-un at his word? The president takes him at his word. No, That's I know he does, but what about you? My opinion doesn't matter. The latest over the weekend's canceled plans to meet with the Taliban at Camp David as part of the Afghan peace talks. The president's entitled to the staff that he wants at, 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 at any moment. But whether a firing or a quitting, one thing is clear. The president moving on to his fourth national security advisor in less than three years. For the top Republican on the Homeland Security Committee, the personnel upheaval is one too many. Senator Ron Johnson advising, I hope you understand instability is not helpful. Three candidates are now being considered to replace him. Charlie Kupperman will take on that role, though, until one of them is named. He's the current deputy national security advisor. He's an advisor also to John Bolton and served in the Reagan administration. But for this, you're fired 
fired president, it now means he has one of, if not the highest turnover rate among his predecessors. Kenneth Janae. And we're trying to keep up with all of it. Serena yep. Marshall there in Washington, thank you for joining us. And one of the challenges faced by the president's national security team is eradicating ISIS, and we're seeing the latest attack on the terror group. The U.S.-led coalition blasted what's being described as an ISIS-infested island in Iraq, dropping <clears throat> 40 tons of explosives. Military officials say the airstrikes targeted an area that had become a safe haven for terrorists. ISIS fighters have been forming sleeper cells in the desert and caves after losing their strongholds in Iraq and Syria. New this morning, an ABC News poll shows five Democratic contenders lead President Trump in head-to-head -head matchups, with several widening their lead due to concerns over the economy. Among those surveyed, former Vice President Joe Biden leads President Trump by 16 percentage points, about the same margin as polls showed two months ago. Senator Bernie Sanders leads the president by 12 points, up from six in July. Senator Elizabeth Warren's lead has increased as well. Polls show her beating President Trump by 11 points compared with seven points previously. Senator Kamala Harris leads Trump by 10 points. And South Bend Mayor Pete Buttigieg has a six-point lead and edge on the president. You can go to abcnews.com for the full results of the poll and stay tuned to ABC News Live for more analysis throughout the day. And some other stories we're watching this morning. Dozens of major wildfires are burning in the West right now. At least 14 of them are in California. Most have not been contained at all. By far the largest is the Walker Fire, about 100 miles north of Sacramento. It has consumed more than 44,000 acres in a national forest. The good news is that the fire danger is subsiding today as winds decrease. We've learned new details about the rescue operation that saved four crew members on that capsized cargo ship off the coast of Georgia. Rescuers say three of the men were perched on pipes and railings for nearly 36 hours before being brought to safety. During that time, the temperature inside the ship hovered around 150 degrees. The Coast Guard says there are no leaks from the ship's fuel tanks, and they hope to reopen the shipping channel for limited traffic as soon as tomorrow. Well, Apple's annual event yesterday unveiled the new iPhone 11 series featuring three cameras, smarter processing, and six new colors. Starting at $700. Plus a 7th generation iPad, Apple's new game subscription service, and the upcoming launch of Apple TV+. Plus. Hmm. Today marks 18 years since the September 11th terror attacks. The beams of light will be shining tonight in New York in memory of those who died. High school students in New Jersey, none of whom had even been born yet, are commemorating the day by planting flags on the lawn of their school for every one of the victims. Here's WABC's Anthony Johnson. Thank you. Paying tribute to the victims of one of the most horrifying days in American history. Students from Cedar Grove High School planting flags next to the names of all of the victims who died on 9-11. It's crazy to think about all those people, but it's good to do it every year and show, show you know, we care. So with great reverence and care, the students are placing nearly 3,000 flags in the ground, showing this community will not forget. When you come out here and you see 2,977 flags with a name attached to each flag, it's personalized. It's a little bit more, the magnitude is bigger. David Schoner was inspired to start this tribute at Cedar Grove High School after a trip to California where he saw this flag tribute to the victims of 9-11 on the campus of Pepperdine University in Malibu. The kids in Cedar Grove have embraced this effort. This display will remain up until the end of September. They want folks to stop by here to remember and pay tribute to all of the victims of 9-11. Everyone has each other's backs in this country, no matter like how different we are, that we'll all always be together and we'll all be one. The flags represent many nations, yet this tribute also includes this piece of World Trade Center steel to remember the two Cedar Grove victims who lost their lives on 9-11. All the kids in our high school right now, no one was born. And to educate them about what happened that day is so very important. In Cedar Grove, New Jersey, Anthony Johnson, Channel 7 Eyewitness News. Also on this 9-11, a new law is taking effect in every public school across New York State. Governor Andrew Cuomo has signed legislation mandating a moment of silence in every New York, pub New York public school to honor the 9-11 victims. The moment of silence will take place at the beginning of the school day every September 11th. The legislation was unanimously approved by state lawmakers on both sides of the aisle before Cuomo signed it. 
and those who lost their lives will be honored at New York's World Trade Center site along with the Pentagon and in Shanksville, Pennsylvania. This is the first 9-11 anniversary since the death of former New York detective Luis Alvarez. While dying from cancer, he urged Congress to extend funding for 9-11 first responders and his brother talked about his fight to the end. For us, in, in a personal sense, there's a deep void. There was a lot of Lou Alvarez's. Anybody who's ever fought for this city, f has fought these sicknesses, uh, they're all Lou Alvarez's and they're all heroes. The Alvarez family will be at the Ground Zero events and several others. Luis Alvarez passed away in June. The president will attend a memorial observance at the Pentagon. Vice President Pence will attend an event in Shanksville, Pennsylvania. Our question on this day of remembrance, how are you remembering September 11th? Please share your thoughts. Um, and even talk about, if you feel free, about what you were doing. I know so many people like to talk about what they were doing on that day that at that news, moment yeah. when they got the news. Um, I think I feel like it's cathartic yep. to um, even 18 years later to share um, those stories. So please tweet us, let us know, comment here on ABC News Live, and we will read through them. Well, coming up, the bizarre medical mystery, the teenager who wakes up every day thinking it's June 11th. But first, the bombshell allegation against NFL star Antonio Brown, his former trainer accusing him of sexual assault. The details after this. Welcome back. Now to the news breaking overnight involving football superstar Antonio Brown. The New England Patriot is now facing a civil lawsuit. His former trainer is accusing him of sexual assault. The bombshell allegations follow Brown's recent headline grabbing behavior, reigniting questions about his future in the NFL. This morning, serious new allegations against one of the best players in pro football. Deep downfield and that's going to be caught. Antonio Brown's former trainer claims he sexually assaulted her on three occasions. In the lawsuit filed in federal court, Brittany Taylor claims Brown exposed himself and kissed her without permission during a training session in 2017. She also claims Brown forcibly raped her at his Miami home last year. Brown is denying the allegations, insisting all sexual encounters with Taylor were consensual. Brown's attorney calls the accusations a money grab, writing that before the alleged assaults, Brown was asked to invest $1.6 million in the accuser's business project, but Brown refused. The fact that she's using her name, I, I think it lends credibility to what she is saying and what the lawsuit is saying. There's no way to know yet what was true and what's not true, but this is very serious. The allegations add to a tumultuous start of the season for the wide receiver. The Raiders signed him for $50 million, but he clashed with the team, with much of the drama playing out during the HBO series Hard Knocks, which followed the team this summer. You know, I got a lot of people around me that depend on me to perform, and you know, this is my livelihood being on my feet. After publicly demanding that the team cut him, Brown released a phone call last week with his head coach. What the hell's going on, man? The Raiders finally caved, releasing Brown. He was then picked up by the Super Bowl champion New England Patriots for a one-year, $15 million contract to play with Tom Brady, possibly joining the team practice as soon as today. But overnight, ESPN reporting NFL Commissioner Roger Goodell could place Brown on the so-called exempt list, meaning he won't be joining the Patriots' active player list while the league investigates the allegations. According to the lawsuit, Brittany Taylor is seeking more than $75,000 from Brown, saying the trauma from the alleged assault made it difficult to maintain her responsibilities at work as a trainer. The Patriots say they're taking the claims very seriously and will wait for the NFL's investigation. ESPN reports Brown is planning to countersue. Her attorney says Brittany Taylor has passed a lie detector test. Moving on to the Trump administration's disputing reports that a CIA operative with access to Vladimir Putin had to be extracted from Russia in part over concerns that President Trump may have put his life in danger. The Kremlin confirmed the official worked there but denied he was a spy. Let's go across the pond to Julia McFarlane in the London Bureau for more on this story. Julia, good morning. Morning, Kenneth. Exactly. This is a fascinating story, is it not? There were reports emerging yesterday, um, as you say, that the U.S. had to extract uh, a Russian spy who had been spying for the Americans uh, for around a decade uh, in 2017, uh, amid reports that officials feared for his life, uh, notably um, after that uh, White House meeting between President Trump, where he uh, revealed classified information to the Russian ambassador, Sergei Kislyak. Now, have to 
to say the White House Press Secretary Stephanie, Stephanie Grisham uh, dismissed the reports and said that they were frankly putting people's lives in danger and that they were false. Uh, the CIA uh, declined to comment. But what uh, CNN and the New York Times have been reporting was that uh, this asset had access um, to Vladimir Putin. He was not a member of his inner circle. But he was working up the ranks of the Russian government. And in fact, he was instrumental in U.S. agencies' conclusion that Vladimir Putin himself directly orchestrated the attempt to infiltrate and, and influence the 2016 presidential election. Uh, now, with all of these spy, spy stories, very murky, hard to know what's real, but some really stunning uh, uh, details, uh, if they are to be, uh, to be true. Stunning indeed. And Israel mm. has fired back after intercepting rockets fired from the Gaza Strip as Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu held a campaign rally. Netanyahu was rushed off the stage Tuesday when two rockets triggered sirens. Julie, as you know, but a week before the election, he's now vowing to annex parts of the West Bank. What would that mean for the peace process? This is really significant, Kenneth. Um, so as you say, uh, President Netanyahu, he was in Ashdod. It's a southern uh, city in Israel, close to uh, Gaza. And he was rushed off stage very dramatically. Um, the Israelis said that they had intercepted two rockets sent from Gaza. Now, what precipitated this is, as you say, uh, Netanyahu announced that if re-elected next week in those elections which are being rerun, uh, he will annex uh, parts of the West Bank. He mentioned the Jordan Valley and uh, north north of the uh, uh, the Dead Sea. Now, Israel has occupied the West Bank since 1967, but they have stopped short of annexation. And this would be a very, very dangerous precedent, according to critics of the plan. The Arab League has slammed this as illegal. The Palestinians' chief negotiator, Saeb Erekat, has described that if if these moves would be carried out, it would be, quote, a war crime and manifestly illegal. I uh, have to remember that the international community does not recognize Israeli settlements in the West Bank. Wow, and we'll keep monitoring that. And some sad news out of Iran, where a woman who was caught trying to enter a soccer stadium there has died after setting herself on fire to protest her arrest. Um, we've seen reports of women wearing false beards to disguise themselves as men to enter matches in the past. So is that what happened here? Yeah, this is a really, really sad story. Um, the girl's name, the, the woman's name uh, was Sahar. And in March, she was detained um, uh, after trying to uh, disguise herself as a man in order to enter uh, a football stadium in Tehran. Uh, now, women have been banned from entering uh, soccer grounds uh, since the 1979 uh, Islamic Revolution. Now, FIFA, uh, soccer's uh, football's uh, world governing body, has been trying to work with the Iranians uh, to try and enforce FIFA's own rules saying that there should not be any kind of discrimination as to who is able to enter stadiums. Um, now, last week, uh, Saha, she set herself on fire outside of the courthouse in Tehran where her case was being heard after she learned that she may be tried in front of uh, a, revolu a revolutionary guard court and possibly face six months in prison. This is a really, really sad story, but it is, it is a, wide, a widespread uh, movement behind this. Recently, six Iranian women were detained, currently now released on bail, uh, for trying to do the same thing, including um, a very talented Iranian photojournalist, female photojournalist, uh, who won the World Press photo for her images capturing women trying to smuggle themselves into the stadium just to watch their favorite sport. Wow, just incredible there. Thank you for those details, Julia. We appreciate it. Thanks, and moving Kenneth. on, there are new problems emerging in the wake of Hurricane Dorian in the Bahamas. Some hurricane refugees who left the disaster zone and traveled to the capital have been turned away from crowded shelters. Government officials are promising more shelters will be set up. Also, the Trump administration reportedly will not grant temporary protected status to residents of the Bahamas affected by Dorian. And with the death toll in the Bahamas at 50, we're getting our first look at what a group of survivors faced during the storm. ABC's Marcus Moore is there. New video shows one group's harrowing brush with Hurricane Dorian. John Slack and his wife Tishka watching the storm move in at a friend's house on Treasure Key because he thought their house would be too dangerous. Nine people, including a four-year-old boy. Helpless as the storm surge pounds the home, breaking a window. That Category 5 wind blowing right through the living room. And that is when... Things really started going downhill quickly. 
It was horrible. We didn't know how high the water was going to get. When the eye passed over, they tried to escape in this vehicle, but it got stuck in the mud. For the first hour and a half with those winds, I don't, I don't think either one of us thought we were going to make it. Slack, his wife, and three other people wound up riding out the back side of Dorian in this SUV for 17 hours before making their way back to the house. The interior now completely destroyed. And Slack believes the fact that their SUV got stuck in the mud likely saved their lives because it meant the wind couldn't blow their SUV away. In the meantime, here in the Bahamas, officials are considering using cruise liners as temporary shelters for thousands of storm survivors who have nowhere to go. Marcus Moore, ABC News, Nassau. All right, so let's take a break from the news and check our notifications. Starting with this, this is a wedding in Malaysia. Incredible. A guy, <laughs> see right there, discovers his doppelganger. Twins. Oh, didn't even know each other, not related. Nope, twins. Love it. Hey, a chimpanzee in Texas is now in its second full day on the run. The animal has been on the loose since Monday near Houston, and reports say the chimp has been harassing people and dogs. There are also unverified claims that tried to grab a cat. Primate experts have been called in to help with the search. Officials are also using a drone to try to track it down. I'm waiting to hear from the chimp. Yeah. And KFC is showing us a new side of Colonel Sanders. He's, of course, a genuine fast food celebrity. Now the chain has announced the launch of a new Colonel Sanders-themed romantic really video Final game. Worth. Oh, my goodness. Famous What's Butters going Worth. on? The objective is to prog progress through a simulated culinary school while trying to romance the Colonel himself because, of course, who hasn't thought of the Colonel that way? Mm -hmm. I love you, Colonel. Sanders reportedly will be released on stream on September 24th. Your move, Popeyes. What oh, you got? Oh, my goodness. Mm -hmm. And um, from chicken to lobster, a fisherman in Maine found a really rare lobster. Look at this. Split right down the middle. Two one tone. side's red, one side's black. Yep, it's apparently it's a genetic mutation. It's like one in like 50 million chance of finding a lobster. These are having that mutation apparently. And we heard it tastes extra good. No, they put it in a little fine, vault fine, to, fine, for fine. everybody to look at. Hey, and in cuter animal news, watch this little lion cub meet his dad for the first time. Simba. Everything the light touches is our kingdom. How about a, everything the light touches in the zoo? Uh-huh. What about the shadowy lands, Dad? Um, um, yeah. <laughs> now to a puzzling case of memory loss yeah. for a teenage girl in Illinois. This is a crazy story. It all started when she apparently suffered a concussion back in June after getting accidentally kicked in the head by another student who was crowd surfing. Every day she wakes up. Riley Horner thinks it's June 11th until she checks the calendar. This morning, she's sharing the medical mystery that continues to leave her doctors baffled. Will Gans has that story. All of this, and then the pre-lab questions. And... Just a few hours from right now, Riley Horner won't remember any of this. I'm very confused, and I like try to think back, and I can't. That's because her memory resets every two hours, and every morning, the same panicked realization. When she wakes up in the morning, she thinks it's June 11th. June 11th, the day Riley was accidentally kicked in the head by a student crowd surfing during a dance. But after dozens of seizures and countless hospital visits, Riley's doctors say her case is still a medical mystery. There's nothing medically wrong. Like they can't see anything medically. You can't see a concussion though on an MRI or a CT scan. The emotional toll also devastating. My brother passed away um, last week and she probably has no idea. And um, we tell her every day, but she doesn't have an idea, no idea about it. The former athlete and scholar taking extensive notes in classes and setting reminders on her phone to look over those notes hours later. Even the most mundane of tasks have become difficult. At school, Riley can't remember where her locker is. I know it's hard for them as much as it's hard for me. And like people just don't understand. They're just, it's like a movie. A movie that mom is desperate to find a happy ending for. They told us that she may just be like this forever, and I'm not okay with that. And the teenager herself just wants to remember some of the best times of her life. I'm not making memories, and I'm just really, like, scared. The Horner family says they're desperately searching for answers and second opinions. Research showing that after six months of short-term memory loss, the damage can be irreversible. Well, coming up, we'll tell you what's on tap for the day ahead. And a scary moment on safari. What happens when this cheetah jumps on top of a vehicle after this?
here's what to watch out for today. Several events are planned to commemorate the anniversary of the September 11th terrorist attacks. Stay tuned to ABC News Live for live coverage of New York's remembrance ceremony at 8.40 a.m. Eastern and a ceremony at the Pentagon at 9.30. President Trump is expected to attend after participating in a moment of silence at the White House. Jury deliberations are set to begin in the trial of a Chinese woman who allegedly lied to Secret Service agents to gain access to President Trump's Mar-a-Lago resort. She faces a possible six-year prison sentence if convicted of trespassing and lying to a federal agent. Democratic candidates for president are getting ready to face off tomorrow night in Houston in the third Democratic primary debate hosted by ABC News. Stay with ABC News Live for more on the candidates and issues on the debrief, as well as an update on all our top stories at the briefing room for an in-depth analysis with our powerhouse political team. Finally, from us this Wednesday, a family from New Jersey is sharing their terrifying encounter with a cheetah. Watch this. The big cat jumped on the roof Whoa. of their open-top Jeep during a safari in Africa. The cheetah didn't look too stressed while it was hanging out. But the woman recording the scene was stressed. I kept saying, oh my gosh, oh my gosh, you know, please don't come near us, please don't come near us. I'm thinking of my kids. I had said to our guide, if for some reason it comes to us, what do we do? And he literally said to me, just sit down and sit still. I'm like, are you crazy? I can't sit down and sit still. After a few minutes, that cheetah got up, ran off into the planes. Isn't that why you go on safari? It's what you pay for. for. Experiences like that, and right? The cheetah's like, look, y'all in my backyard. Yeah, it seems like that trip was worth every penny. Mm -hmm. That's it from us um, on this Wednesday. Yes. Um, Have a good one. Take care. We will see you tomorrow.